Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Father Fitzgerald, for that wonderful introduction. You know, it's so funny. I got stopped by the velvet rope there. I hope that doesn't happen when I'm trying to get into heaven. <laughs> and this speaking in this place, it's like a it's like a foretaste of heaven. So it, it's a great honor, a great joy to be to be speaking uh, in uh, America's first first cathedral. Um, so I, I'm especially glad about the subject that I have to uh, speak to you uh, uh, about tonight uh, because it's uh, about someone who's not only dear to my heart, although he died before I could ever meet him, uh, but he's also dear in the hearts of millions of people around the world, uh, at least if they don't know him uh, personally through his name, they know him through the great influence that he had on Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson, who developed the 12 steps. Uh, I'm here to speak to you tonight about a Catholic priest, a Jesuit priest, uh, who was a spiritual guide, a spiritual mentor to Bill Wilson during the early years of Alcoholics Anonymous and who was important in helping to spread AA and also in helping people to discover uh, that the 12 steps are valuable not only for recovery from alcoholism but from recovery but for recovery from any unwanted habit so uh, this person I'm speaking to you about this Jesuit priest is father Ed Dowling uh, whom I researched for my new biography father Ed the story of Bill W's spiritual sponsor uh, so uh, the talk that follows will be in uh, three main parts. Uh, first, I'll tell you a bit about Father Ed uh, himself, and especially I'll tell you about where he developed his sympathy with alcoholics. Uh, I'll tell you second uh, about uh, Father Ed's encounter with AA and particularly with its co-founder, Bill Wilson, and then finally, since this talk is about journeying through Lent with Father Ed Dowling, uh, I'll speak to you about how the same spirituality with which Father Ed, as he's called, the same spirituality with which Father Ed encouraged Bill Wilson and thereby encouraged members of AA, uh, that same spirituality can encourage us uh, regardless of whether we have any uh, addiction to overcome uh, we are in Lent, after all, and in Lent, uh, every one of us is trying to uh, over, uh, overcome uh, our um, temptations to, to sin. And uh, Father Ed uh, was certainly familiar with those, and he had uh, a very beautiful spirituality for, uh, for combating specifically the temptation to despair, which is a sin uh, against, against hope. And it's something that he was himself tempted with uh, many times and learned to, uh, to overcome. Uh, so first, with regard to Father Ed, uh, I should tell you that even though, as I've said, I'm very blessed to speak here this evening, in Father Ed's eyes, I would be considered underprivileged. Uh, but that's OK, because Father Ed considered himself underprivileged too. Um, I'm underprivileged in Father Ed's eyes because I'm not an alcoholic, so I can't be a member of AA. And Father Ed wasn't an alcoholic either, so he couldn't be a member of AA either. Um, and for that reason, he felt himself underprivileged. He greatly admired members of AA. He admired them for their fellowship, first and foremost. And second of all, uh, he uh, admired them because they, they were open and, and honest uh, about themselves. They spoke directly about God. And as he put it, uh, they didn't look at the, the, the word God, the name God, as if it were something indelicate, like legs in the Victorian age. Uh, so, uh, so he um, really uh, felt personally a need for that fellowship, that 12-step spirituality that AA had. Um, and that need that he had came from an experience that he had, which was akin to 
the experience that alcoholics have of hitting bottom. Only in Father Ed's case, it wasn't due to alcoholism, it was due to a crisis of faith. And uh, he experienced this crisis of faith while he was in the Jesuit novitiate, the first two years of the Je uh, Jesuit uh, road of, of formation. So uh, to tell you a bit about where Father Ed was or where young Edward Dowling was uh, when he uh, entered novitiate, uh, his nickname was Puggy, so uh, we can call him Puggy Dowling uh, during his time up to, up to the novitiate. Uh, he was called Puggy because of his pug nose. They gave people nicknames like that in those days. He was born in 1898, died in 1960, uh, and in, he, was from, he was from St. Louis, Missouri, although Baltimore played an important role in his history with regard to uh, AA, as I'll share with you momentarily. Uh, but uh, in St. Louis, at St. Saint, Saint Louis High, uh, he was uh, a star baseball player, and it looked for a while like he was going to go into baseball. He was also a star uh, baseball player uh, in college at uh, St. Mary's College in, in Kansas. Um, and uh, he, he left college uh, after, after two years uh, to go into, not baseball actually, because his tryout for the Chicago White Sox, they told him he wasn't ready. Uh, so instead he went into journalism and he was a journalist for a year, loved it. Uh, Father Ed was always at the center of whatever social circle he was in as a young man. Uh, they looked at him as not, you know, a great sinner. Uh, he was a good Catholic, Catholic boy, but he liked fun. He liked, besides sports, he liked playing billiards. After his newspaper sh shift, he would stay up, you know, late at night at an all-night diner with his fellow reporters and chat with the waitresses. He enjoyed the life that he had as a young Catholic man in St. Louis. Uh, but he had this nagging feeling uh, that he was called to something higher. Uh, and so um, he decided at the age of 21 to enter the Society of Jesus, to go into the Jesuits novitiate in Florissant, Missouri. Uh, now, uh, at the age of 21, believe it or not, you know, since it was 1919, he was considered a late vocation to the Jesuits. Now, if there's any, any unmarried man here who's, who's feeling a call to the uh, priesthood, either of the Jesuits or of the uh, of Archdiocese of Baltimore, you can rest assured that if you're 21 years old, you will not be considered a late vocation. Uh, but back then, uh, Father Ed was. These other novices in the Jesuits um, were uh, young men who were coming in straight out of high school, plus they had gone to seminary high schools. They had some idea of how to comport themselves, how to, how to behave, and, and, and so on. But Father Ed, he was not used to getting up early. He was not used to uh, being ready to go every time a bell rang, you know, every 15 minutes during the day at the Jesuit seminary, that a bell would ring and they'd be, and they'd have to, you know, go to one kind of work and then go to a different kind of work and then spend 15 minutes reading from Thomas Kempis' Imitation of Christ and then, and then go to, go to, go to lunch. Uh, they, they couldn't, uh, the novices could not speak to each other except in Latin. That was to keep, uh, to keep their conversations short. Uh, they could only speak English for, I think, like an hour a day, you know, during evening recreation. And I think maybe Thursday was a, a, a rest day when they could relax and speak English. The rest of the time, it was pretty regimented. And so here, Father Ed, young Puggy Dowling, I should say, Edward Dowling, had, was thinking that he had this great call to the priesthood. He was going to um, go to the novitiate, put on the Jesuit cassock, and get 
holy. He really believed this. He wrote to a friend of his who couldn't believe that he was going into the Jesuit novitiate because the Jesuits were considered God's Marines at that time. You know, for an Irish young man, like the highest vocation at that time was priesthood, and then the super highest vocation was Jesuit priesthood. So before, before Edward went into the novitiate, he was trying to explain to this incredulous friend why he was going into it, and he said, you know, you've got to understand that I'm looking towards heaven, and every thought that a Jesuit has is the highest thought imaginable, otherwise our faith is a sham. This was what young Puggy Dowling believed. He believed that he was going to put on that Jesuit cassock, and he would be super holy and like chorus of angels would announce that he had found his vocation. Well, maybe he didn't believe in the, that he'd hear the chorus of angels, but on a spiritual level, he thought that he would have this great sense of security from day one. Did not happen. Here he was with his, you know, habits which were considered quite sloppy by his superiors and even his fellow novices. And, you know, and he, he, he had his, 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 la his, his laziness and also just his um, feeling that um, yeah, of isolation. You know, he had been at the center of his social circle. Now as a Jesuit, he wasn't permitted to have particular friends. He, he could be, you know, part of this brotherhood of Jesuits, but he couldn't like have a best friend in, in the Jesuits. And he, he wasn't even allowed to like pat someone else on the back because all touching between novices was, uh, was for, forbidden. Um, ex except in sports, and, and Father Ed was, as in high school and college, he was the best soccer player in the novitiate. That was, a, that was one uh, relief for him. But overall, he felt really broken down. He, he thought that, you know, since he wasn't thinking holy thoughts as soon as he put on the cassock, maybe the faith was a sham. Maybe all these things that he had imagined about what the Catholic faith was and what was his calling to the priesthood, um, maybe it was all just a delusion. Uh, he really worried about this. Uh, the one thing that, that helped him uh, to some degree uh, was the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius that he made. Uh, the spiritual exercises are a 30-day uh, retreat in which the Jesuit novice has the experience of, of uh, during each week of the, the four uh, main weeks of the, of the retreat, uh, the Jesuit will, um, and these, these retreats, by the way, are for lay people as well, but every Jesuit novice has to make them. So, so the person making the uh, retreat uh, essentially meditates on the mysteries of Jesus' life. Now we call everything in Jesus' life to some degree a mystery because Jesus isn't just, doesn't, doesn't just um, have a, a human nature, he's also God. And so um, anything that we meditate on from Jesus' life is a mystery in the sense that we'll never get to the bottom of it. And so the Ignatian Spiritual Exercises Retreat is that experience of, uh, of walking with Jesus through from his birth to his, his life in Nazareth to his baptism and his preaching and miracles. And then finally, what we do in Holy Week, really, we walk with Jesus uh, through his suffering, his death, and, fin and finally, thank God, Easter Sunday, his resurrection. So in that walk, young Edward Dowling began to feel that he, in a certain sense, uh, belonged but, uh, in the Jesuits, but it, it wasn't enough. Um, and so uh, he spent the next year, because he, he, the novitiates two years, he made the 30-day exercises, as all novices do very shortly after, uh, entering the society. Uh, so he spent the next year trying to persuade his Jes Jesuit novice master to let him make the 30-day spiritual exercises again when the new crop of novices uh, came in. And uh, that had never been done before in the Jesuits in their 400-year history up to then. It has never been done since in the Jesuits' history. Amazingly, miraculously. 
uh, the novice master actually permitted young Edward Dowling SJ to make the spiritual exercises a second time. And through that, and through his um, reading The Imitation of Christ, uh, what he came to believe, as he uh, wrote later to uh, his, to his uh, sister, uh, was that uh, he believed that when Jesus said, take up, uh, take up my cross, and uh, take, t or t when, he's, when, he si when he said to, th that each of us should take up our, our cross and follow him, that Jesus was um, making a personal invitation to, to each of us and young Edward Dowling came to realize that somehow, for reasons that he didn't even completely understand, but somehow the life of the Jesuit was a life of daily crosses, and that somehow in this life, God was going to make him happy because it was called to do. But he didn't quite know how that was. He just knew that that was going to happen. And so at the very last minute, at the end of the two-year novitiate, after really hitting bottom spiritually, he got enough faith, enough hope and charity to make his first vows. And because he waited till the last minute, he took the vow name, each Jesuit uh, takes a vow name, kind of similar to the way that uh, we take a confirmation name, uh, he took the vow name Dismas. Uh, does anyone here know who Saint Dismas is? Yes. So, so who's Saint Dismas? Yes, that's right. That's right. Saint Dismas was the good thief who got in at the last minute. Jesus promised him paradise from the cross. So that was who. Uh, through, that was who Edward Dowling identified with, and it's quite significant for his later ministry uh, that he identified with the lowest in society, with the criminal, the thief, who at the last minute wins paradise. Um, so uh, as, a, as a priest, well actually, before skipping to his priesthood, I should tell you, Father Ed didn't just experience the, the spiritual suffering in his Jesuit formation. Shortly after that, he experienced physical suffering as well. After he made his first vows, he was on this spiritual high. He really felt this great consolation, the relief of having finally solidified his, his, um, his uh, knowledge that, that this was his voc vocation. Um, and during those first few weeks, that kind of honeymoon as a new Jes Jesuit uh, junior, having made it through the novitiate, he was walking with another uh, Jesuit scholastic, as the seminarians are called, when he felt a twinge in his leg. Uh, and uh, the pain got worse through his 20s. He was only 23 when he felt that first twinge, and this was after being this great athlete, even known as the best soccer player in the Jesuit novitiate, um, very quickly he became quite disabled. Um, and only years later, it was diagnosed as ankylosing spondylitis, which is a, a rare extreme form of arthritis. So by the time Father Ed was ordained at uh, the age of 32, um, he was walking as though he had a steel rod up his spine. His spine was calcified. Uh, he also uh, had calcified bones in his leg. Uh, his sister uh, worried, uh, she confided to a friend that she worried that when he made the full prostration at his ordination that he might not be able to get up without aid. Imagine this 31-year-old man who had been always outstanding physically now looking and walking like an old man. Uh, so uh, Father Ed um, received a job as a Jesuit uh, that was really considered the lowest ranking job. He had gotten on the wrong side of his superiors because his interests had been outside the range of acceptable Jesuit interests. At that time, Jesuits were supposed to excel 
in theology or philosophy. Um, they were not supposed to be interested in psychology, which, which, uh, which Father Ed was, um, especially he was interested in the spiritual exercises and in the whole psychology behind them. Father Ed was also into politics. He was really into, and I, I mean obsessively into, uh, what we would now call ranked choice voting, proportional representation. Uh, you might know proportional representation as the method by which Alaska uh, recently uh, received uh, a Democratic senator who was its first uh, Native American uh, senator. Um, proportional representation as ranked choice voting is now known as a means by which people in minority groups who might not normally get representation can get representation. Well, Father Ed, a hundred years before it was cool, was really into this. The Jesuits didn't like that, so they just put him on like the slow track. He was not sent for doctoral studies. He was not um, given any kind of elite job as an academic. Um, he wasn't even put to teach in a high school because when he taught in a high school uh, as, a, 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 during his formation, uh, although his students loved him and they all came to him with their problems, he wasn't actually good at teaching. <laughs> um, so, uh, so he was just given this pretty lowly job as associate editor at a Jesuit publishing house called The Queen's Work. But people sought him out because they knew that he had this understanding and that any problem they came to him with, he would be sympath sympathetic. He would help them both spiritually and practically. As a former St. Louis newspaper uh, reporter, he had connections at City Hall. Uh, so he wouldn't just like send people away with a, with, 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 you know, a, a prayer and encouragement. He would also make phone calls when necessary or, he, or also connect people with others who, who, could, who could help them. Uh, he even had a, a poor box in his office that he called the, the St. Dismas Rich Box where when well-to-do people came to him for help, you know, they, if they wanted to, could put money in it. Anyone could put in money in it, and then anyone could take out money from it as much as they wanted. Uh, so he was quite an unusual person, um, and it was through his ministry to people with problems that he was called upon to help a newspaper reporter who was this terrible drunk, uh, a Chicago reporter, uh, and th this uh, reporter's drunkenness uh, had um, caused him to become, has ca caused his wife to run off uh, with the uh, two baby girls that they had uh, until, you know, the husband uh, whose last name, well, his, I'll say his first name, Edwin, until uh, Edwin uh, uh, could uh, dry up. So Father Ed worked his magic with Edwin and, and with his, his wife, uh, Grace, managed to get them to reunite, managed to get Edwin to promise not to drink. But that was all he could do, just ask for a promise, because it was January 1940, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, people didn't know about it. It only existed in um, New York, Baltimore. It had just started in Baltimore in 1940. Also uh, in uh, Chicago, it didn't exist in St. Louis. Thanks to Father Ed, that would change fairly quickly. Um, uh, but um, before Alcoholics Anonymous, to give you just an idea, there was nothing that was shown to work for, uh, for um, healing people from alcoholism. Um, there were medical interventions that were tried, but these were terrible, really invasive interventions like electroshock therapy or uh, or um, a, a frontal um, lobotomy. Uh, so there really just wasn't hope for alcoholics before AA. Uh, whatever one may say about AA now, and you know, some people, you know, people have strong opinions over whether it's the best um, treatment or not for alcoholics. One thing that everyone has to agree on is that it was the first method ever to give real hope to alcoholics for healing uh, and recovery from alcoholism. So after Father Ed sent uh, Edwin and his wife Grace back to Chicago um, uh, with the promise that Edwin wouldn't drink, he, Father Ed thought he'd come back up and check on this couple a few weeks later. 
And when he came to see uh, Edwin, who, as I mentioned, was a newspaper reporter, Edwin still wasn't uh, drinking, which was good news. And Edwin told Father Ed that he was hanging out with a group of his fellow drunks, these other like newspaper reporters and other alcoholics, and that they were all encouraging each other to stay sober, and that they called themselves Alcoholics Anonymous. And Father Ed was rather concerned about this. <laughs> but then he went to a meeting, and he started to hear what happened at a meeting. Now, at an AA meeting, it's centered around people telling their stories. Uh, they tell their stories about, you know, their, um, their struggles as well as their triumphs, and they, they help one another. It's really like a group of wounded uh, healers, and they have a book that's called The Big Book uh, that was um, uh, that was largely written by Bill Wilson, the co-founder of AA. The book includes 12 steps. Well, Father Ed was not only really impressed by this idea of a fellowship of wounded healers, uh, but he was also really impressed with the 12 steps um, because uh, with the help of another Jesuit whom he showed the 12 steps to, he came to see that the 12 steps had some real similarities to the spiritual exercises in St. Ignatius. In the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, a key part of it is that when you go through the mysteries of Jesus' life, you get formed the way that Jesus' disciples got formed. And the way they got formed was through Jesus guiding them through the, the uh, three main stages uh, or ways of the spiritual life. First, there's the purgative way. We certainly know that way in Lent. Uh, with Lent being about uh, purgation. Um, the purgative way is the way of, of recognizing one's powerlessness before God and one's dependence upon God and asking God's help for uh, getting rid of sin and uh, of the temptations to sin. Then there's the illuminative way, which is letting Jesus teach us how to be like him, how to live on the upward path, the life of virtue. And then the, the third and final way of the spiritual life is the unitive way. That's when having, uh, having let God purify us of, of sin and, and having worked to build virtue with God's help, in the unitive way of the spiritual life, we, um, we love God so much that we don't want anything to separate us from him. Uh, well, Father Ed saw this, these, these different ways in the 12 steps of AA. Um, only the first step has anything to do with alcohol. It just says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Then it goes right into this surrender. That's the beginning of the purgative way. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So the 12 steps aren't really about quitting alcohol or quitting anything. They're about getting something positive, getting sane. Um, it, we could call this also just getting, getting virtuous. Um, step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Well, fa well Father Ed, um, he, in his um, excitement over discovering the connections between the 12 steps and the spiritual exercises. He imagined that this Bill Wilson, who, who uh, wrote the, the 12 Steps, must be this great spiritual master. What he didn't know was that Bill Wilson was you know, this, this failed stockbroker who had no real Christian formation until like very recently when he had briefly belonged to a Protestant group that he quit when it got a little too uh, controlling. Um, Bill had, um, Bill had written the 12 steps with, with help from his, his Christian friends, but also with help from the other alcoholics who had um, made up the first 100 members of AA. Uh, so at the time that Father Ed went to visit Bill, and the Baltimore part of this is that Father Ed, you know, he lived in St. Louis. He had a fear of flying, so he traveled by train. And uh, he first uh, traveled to Washington by train to get to New York to meet Bill Wilson. Then he traveled from Washington to Baltimore, stayed with the Jesuits at Woodstock, 
and then took the train from the train station where I came in just tonight, took the train to New York to meet Bill Wilson in November 1940. But what Father Ed didn't know was that Bill was on what Bill would later call a dry bender, a dry drunk. Bill was angry and frustrated when Father Ed unexpectedly dropped in on him. Uh, Father uh, Bill Wilson was, was angry that AA hadn't taken off. Uh, he or he had thought he was going to dry up all the alcoholics in the world, and it wasn't happening, just in a few cities. Um, so so uh, Father Ed you know, dropped in on, on, on Bill at the AA clubhouse where Bill was living in, in Manhattan, and he said to Bill, uh, I've been very taken with the similarities between your spiritual exercises and, uh, and, and rather with you, have been taken with the spirituality between your 12 steps and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. And Bill Wilson responded, never heard of them. <laughs> and Father Ed laughed. And, and uh, Bill um, felt very um, comfortable with, uh, with Father Ed. And you know, during, I think I have about 10 minutes left. Is that, is that, is that correct? I've got my timekeeper here. Uh, about, is that a so-so or, okay, good, good. Okay, great, because now I want to t t start telling you about what advice Father Ed gave Bill and what uh, advice he gave to people in general who are suffering from frustration, sadness, loneliness. In Bill's case, uh, Bill's, B Bill explained to Father Ed that his frustration came largely just through his uh, dissatisfaction with having these expectations that here he was doing this good work and it was going to take off and it hadn't taken off yet. And Father Ed responded to him, blessed are they who hunger and thirst. Uh, so he, he quoted the Beatitudes to him, but in a new way. Uh, and then, and then uh, Bill said to him, won't there be any satisfaction? And Father Ed said, no, never. <laughs> but this was actually good news because ultimately what Father Ed impressed upon him was really a, a very Augustinian message um, because Father Ed uh, knew, his, um, knew Augustine's confessions. And you know, in the confessions, Augustine begins uh, with Oh Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless un until they rest in thee. Uh, what Father Ed was trying to impress upon Bill and did impress upon Bill uh, was that this same thirst that caused Bill to be so frustrated, um, the thirst was actually a gift from God, uh, but the frustration that Bill was experiencing was because Bill was directing the frustration to what um, St. Ignatius of Loyola would call a lesser good. Uh, so, um, so, you know, at first Bill's thirst had been directed towards drink. That's very obviously a lesser good. Um, you know, drink, you know, alcohol is a great thing when Jesus comes to us through us through it in, in his in the mass alcohol in moderation uh, if, with if you're able to drink it in moderation can be good in Bill's case this directing his thirst and putting his whole thirst in alcohol uh, was destructive but then Bill had this thirst to do a seemingly good thing dry up alcoholics have AA spread, here he's doing a good thing. But even that was something that was a lesser good because what Bill had to do was, was what, uh, what we're, we're told um, in, in the gospel to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these, meaning all, all the good things that, that God knows we need will be added uh, to, uh, to us. Um, so if Bill, Father Ed impressed upon Bill that if he directed his thirst to God, then God would order his steps so that 
whatever he did in his work with alcoholics, um, whether it took off as thank God it did or not, um, Bill could have the satisfaction that every time he met an alcoholic and was present to an alcoholic, he was meeting Christ, meeting Christ in the, in the least of these. Uh, as, uh, as our Lord says in Matthew 25, when he says, whatever you do for the least of these, you did it for me. And in fact, Bill had already intuited that because in the 12th step of AA, Bill had included what he himself had learned, which was that he couldn't stay sober unless he was helping other people to uh, get sober. Uh, the 12th step says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Uh, so, so, you know, Bill knew that he received some type of satisfaction in carrying the message. And what Father Ed impressed upon him uh, was that it was that satisfaction that he got in helping an alcoholic that was a foretaste of the satisfaction that he would only fully receive uh, in, in heaven. But we do receive a foretaste of heaven when we are seeking God's grace to live the upward path through the different stages of the spiritual life. Uh, that's why in our Lent, we begin with this purification, but the purification is so that we can make room uh, for God to fill us with his, uh, with his grace. Um, and if you're interested in a good thing to read about this, um, besides my book, uh, a good thing to read about this is actually uh, Augustine's letter number 130. Augustine letter 130 on prayer is where Augustine says this, that this is the whole purpose of purgation. It's like if we have this little like leather wallet and we want it to hold, we want someone to put a lot of money in our wallet. Augustine isn't afraid of using analogies that are appealing even to our lower side sometimes. Um, Augustine says if you have a little leather wallet, you want someone to put a lot in it, you have to have the leather stretched. And Augustine says that's what we ask God to do with our souls uh, through, um, uh, through purging ourselves of sin. God stretches our soul so that our soul can have room for God to pour in his grace, which is the meaning of, uh, of, of what Jesus does for us at every Mass, and particularly uh, what he does for us as we walk with him through the mysteries of his life, through the, his passion and, and, de and death and, uh, and resurrection. Um, I'd like to leave you with something a bit of Father Ed's humor, but it's also, uh, it's also, it's also true. Um, uh, Father Ed, um, as I said, he was not unacquainted with, with suffering, both spiritual suffering and, uh, both spiritual suffering and physical suffering. Uh, and for Father Ed, he didn't, you know, he was kind of like St. Therese of Lisieux in this way, in that he didn't find God through these like great visions. Uh, he found God in a certain way through uh, recognizing God in, in his absence, e even more than in his presence. He, he recognized God in his own loneliness. He could understand that um, he wasn't alone. He was alone with God. It wasn't really loneliness. It was solitude. You know, the, the word, um, Monk comes from monos, which, which, um, which means um, one, but it really means being one with God. Solitude is like that. We are not just solo, we are solo with God. And so I'll, I'll leave you with this quote from Father Ed on the, the negative way, the via negativa, as theologians call it. Um, this is uh, something that uh, Father Ed said to a conference of AA in 1955, 
um, he said, there is a negative approach from agnosticism. This was the approach of Peter the Apostle. Lord, to whom shall we go? I doubt if there is anybody in this hall who really ever sought sobriety. I think we were trying to get away from drunkenness. I don't think we should despise the negative. I have a feeling that if I ever find myself in heaven, it will be from backing away from hell. <laughs> well, I wish you a very happy and blessed backing away from hell this Lent uh, so that our, your and my entrance in, into heaven uh, with, with, with Jesus um, this Easter Sunday will be even more, uh, more blessed. So, uh, so thank you so much, and God bless you. And I, I'd love to meet each of you, and if you'd like to purchase a book, to sign your book. Thank you.